Welcome to South Beach Sessions, and I will tell Marcellus Wiley this off the top. I'm sure he's felt it off of me, but I will tell him for the first time uh, that I admire you so much, mm. uh, meaningfully, because your story is amazing, and only part of it. I mean, it starts with me discovering that you made it from Compton to Columbia, but then it got interesting to me. Like that was plenty. <laughs> that was plenty interesting because yeah. you lived a tough football life and you fought your way in business in the broadcasting sphere. So I will tell the audience, Marcellus Wiley is someone I've admired for a long time because uh, the pain that you played with mm. and the strength that you had that you showed on and off the field has been something that's been remarkable to me. So thank you for coming in and joining us here in your city because uh this this place feels very you right you you love uh you love everything about this place yes i'm la to the core man and I, i'll be remiss if i didn't give you your flowers um i don't know your age uh but i've always looked up to you always respected you uh the way that you could always peel back the layers the way that you approached the craft the way that you did it your success and it's funny even through all my journey since we met each other I would always reach out with the random text, and it was always at some critical points where I just needed some affirmation, some assurance from the triple OG yourself. So I just want to say that uh, whatever you see in me, it's always this Voltron effect of pulling from people that I uh, look up to and people that inspire me. Man. Uh, thank you for that. I yeah. will receive it. Uh, I don't know if you remember, one of the first times I talked to you was uh, on the Bristol campus in the cafeteria, you and Jalen Rose. Mm -hmm. uh, how long had you been at ESPN at that point? Woo! I got there in 2007, so I've been hitting the head a lot. When do we have that to meet? <laughs> I, I, yeah, no, I don't know, yeah. but uh, but it you had been there a while, and I came up to you and I said, they're not using you guys right. Mm. The breadth of your personality, they're not... They're, they're putting you in a box. You come out, you stand in a place, they ask you a question, be the football expert, be the basketball expert, yeah. and they're not showing what incredible breath you you guys had. And I just remember, the reason I remember the conversation is because you forced your way into showing everyone at that company and everyone in the country. Uh, it wasn't because that place was confining yes, to you. Say it again. And, and, and you broke free of it to show people the full force of your personality. Yeah, you know, and it was intentional. Um, I just didn't know when to detonate uh, because you get there, you know, you're a rookie, it feels like, and coach tells you to run a play and you run it respectfully. And then one thing I've learned over the years that no matter what situation you're in, there's a lion inside of you that's waiting to be uncaged. And um, usually that comes from comfort and confidence, all these kind of choice words. But basically, you know where those keys are. And it's like, when do I unleash this lion? When do I let people hear him roar? And for me, I didn't know when to do it, where to do it. I was like, first, just have job security. Just stay here. Um, but beyond that, I remember talking to Mike Golick uh, pretty early in my stay there. And he said, you're a storyteller. And he says, you have a story to tell. He's like, stay off the script. Don't do the X's and O's. Don't do what they want you to do, but tell them who you are. And that sounded great coming from him, but at the same time, I'm like, you're Mike Golick, you're on Mike and Mike. Like, I can't pull that right now. Uh, but then that was actually validated by Seth Markman, who came to me after my 10th NFL Live show. He's like, look, I don't know what you're saying up there, what you're doing up there, but you're not long for this game, not long for this business. And I looked at him like, uh-oh, here come my walking papers already. And guess what he said after that? He said, and that's actually a good thing. He's like, you're bigger than the role we have for you right now. I don't know what the next role is for you, but we'll figure that out. That turns into Sports Nation. That turns into more personality-based commentary. And then I was off to the races. And then it seems, and I haven't talked to you in a while, it <clears throat> got a little too fluffy for you. You are somebody who has always excelled beyond any reasonable expectation. And I, I've not had this conversation with you, but I have felt from afar, oh, Marcellus was tired of eating the cotton candy. Mm-hmm tired and he's like i'm a grown adult who has lived a full life i would like to talk to people beyond sports i'd like to teach them some things about the america we're living in right now oh absolutely um it and it happened over time it wasn't just one day it wasn't the pandemic it wasn't any incident uh it started with knowing that sports has always been my entryway my entrance to a new frontier like born in compton okay and, 
Where are you going to get your identity, your self-esteem? How are you going to navigate around all the ills in my community? And sports was always the entrance to something else. So that allowed me to go to a good high school. And I say good because these kids were actually thinking next level, secondary education, et cetera. It takes me to Columbia and allows me to go to the NFL. Then sports allowed me to have an opportunity to go to ESPN with a Columbia degree and jump the line of all these future Hall of Famers that I was able to get the show before them. And then I'm in the game for 20 years, it felt like. And I'm like, I'm still doing the same thing. What's the next frontier? And I think I was just inching closer and closer to that. Co-host after co-host, uh, ice skating, as I call it, surface level shows after surface level shows. Got tired of saying Jets, Patriots, who you got? Oh, by three. And I was like, man, I got four kids at home. There's real life in, in my house present day. And they're looking forward. And I got to give them a world that's better than the one I inherited. And I'm not going to do that just yelling Jets and Patriots. Uh, so I didn't want to disrupt the economic model that existed because it was beneficial to me and beneficial to many others. But I knew it wasn't going to allow me to show all of my, my, my skills, my attributes. It wasn't going to allow me to flex all my muscles. So I had to make a change. I'd like to talk to you about some of that journey and what you've learned in broadcasting and in football. But... When you mentioned the kids, you felt you would be failing them as a father. Because this I've also seen from afar, and I don't know you this way, but what I've seen from you uh, and your uh, love life in public, you seem very in love, deeply, yeah. deeply in love. And, sh and she seems from afar like someone who admires the man you really are and yeah. the man she thinks you can be. And you can't be the dad that she expects you to be or that you expect to be if you're just cash and checks. Uh, because you could keep feeding the machine just saying the things that need to be said as, you know, broadcasting great Marcellus Wiley. Yes. Deeper meaning. Um, impact. Uh, I think the moments for me were looking at my kids. And, you know, you live that American dream to some degree in your head where you're like, wow, rags to riches, I made it, or I made it to the league, or I'm on TV, and I've checked all those boxes. And I still felt, hollow to a point and I was like why you don't have the total fulfillment especially because you dreamt of having all of these things you have all these things in abundance and they still don't fulfill you they still don't fill that bucket and I didn't know what it was until I started to really rear my children all four of my kids all together and I was like that's what it is I'm not looking at life through my scope anymore I'm looking at it forward through their lens this world looks different than the world I grew up in. So for me, it was pretty simple, even though it was, it was tasking. Uh, it was really simple. I looked around when I was little, and I was like, I'm smart, and I'm good in sports. That's all I got. And then I looked around at everyone else, and I was like, I saw talent after talent, but I also saw dreams unfulfilled. And I saw the gangs, the drugs, the poverty, all that stuff was in the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I said, there's something worse here. And it was the low ambition. I saw people who having jobs, not careers. No one, it felt like, that I knew could say, yes, I made my dreams a reality. And I was like, that's what I'm going to do. My goal in life is make my dreams a reality. And I yeah, used my school work, used my, uh, my, my, my skills on the field to get there. And then when I got there, I did all the simple things that you would do. Buy the cars, date the girls spend some money, ball out. I did all those things. Still needed to feel more fulfilled. I had my family. And then it hit me, Dan. I'm coaching. So I coach my son. He's eight years young. And I'm coaching. And I'm literally working at Fox. And I'm coaching my son. And this is when I finally realized what it was. And I'm looking at all these kids. And one day it was just randomly. Cooper Cup, Matthew Stafford showed up to our championship game. And after it, they all want a picture and stuff with them, so I take them over there, introduce them. Uh, then we come back as a team. And I was like, so who's your favorite players? They're like, Cooper Cup, yeah, yeah. And I was like, all right, and Matthew Stafford, yeah, yeah, we love them. That fast, they, they converted from other players. Then we talk in other sports, and they're telling me all these names. And I was like, damn, I really do a job. I really work at a place 
that I would tear down some of these kids' heroes. I, I'm actually feeding what these kids are trying to build up. I'm tearing down. And I was like, not me personally, but what I do and where I'm at. And then I started to realize, oh, I can't participate in that anymore that way. And that's what you probably witness is just a shift of my mindset and my, my mindset and my spirit of like, I don't want to do it this way anymore. And I knew that was the way to the riches. I knew that was the way to success. And when you abandon that, obviously you're going to either plateau or you need to move on and do it your way. You blew through the, the gangsters, the poverty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. But I mean, you do. You blow. You you blew through that part when, uh, like, if if we want, let's do this a bit biographically before we arrive at the father that you are and the husband that yeah, you are. Let's uh, do it. Uh, your your scars must run deep, but you're mm. tough, and you just say the the gangs, the poverty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not tough, uh, but yes, I, I've learned to give is to get. So if I don't want to get any negativity, I don't want anything coming my way that's bad, I can't give that out. Um, I also learned that attention is invention. So I was a youngster, and I was like, these suckers are everywhere, and they're running the neighborhood, they're punking everybody, they're robbing, they're killing they're doing all what they do. They're messing with me here and there. How do I get away from this? And I was like, you can't ignore it fully because you got to learn the code. You got to learn how to, how to navigate through it, walk around this, see this, know what this hat means, know what this sign means, know who they are, know where they from. And so I didn't want to, but I had to, Dan, use up so much of my mental space on bull, like just straight BS, on straight, how am I going to get home today? Oh, there they go. Or how am I going to get there and I can't take that bus? Or how am I going to go over there and I can't wear it is? And my scars, I'm not tough. That's part of how I survived. I didn't even fake it. I didn't even try to flirt with it. I had no interest in being hard, tough, gangster, running the streets. And that, with the protection of I was good in sports, they couldn't box me in. I had family that was in the streets. My mother had three brothers. Two were killed, murdered. One committed suicide, all street life. And that's where we moved from Compton to Greener Pastures, which ended up being South Central L.A., which, if you know both, <laughs> it's kind of a lateral move if, at best. Um, you were a nerd. Oh, no? Bonafide nerd, straight up front class, no no apple for the teacher, but still just raising my hand, intellectually curious. Thought it was not only valuable, but it was the best way to utilize your time to actually sit in class, be attentive, raise your hand, try to learn. Like I, I didn't understand the paradigm, the dynamic of, no, nah, it's better to be in the back of the class cr cracking jokes and being cool and looking fresh, I was like, that's dumb. But I knew that was dumb because I had family, like I said, my uncles, who were street life vets, OGs. Everywhere they went, everybody respected them. Everywhere they went, everyone bowed down to them. But every time they came in the house, I saw the real. I saw the real pain. I saw that they didn't have much. I saw that my grandmother, their mom, was constantly on them for real reasons. And I was like, damn, look at the dichotomy of them out there, everybody bowing down, and them in here, they don't know which way is up. And I, I just lived behind that veil of what a real gangster life was and never, ever tried to play it off and never tried to live up to that part. How does one survive all of that? Because of that, that's what you're saying? What helped you survive it is just you were authentically yourself and just forever wary and... Um, <laughs> and eager to learn uh, something because that's, those are adult processes that you are doing when you're doing the math of a uh, very early, I need something better. I don't know that kids always know that. I think uh, kids grow up in what they grow up in and then they think that's their normal and that's what life's supposed to be. Yeah. I mean, and that's why when you said my scars run deep, 
is because I did have to fast forward through some of those childhood moments. I had to get past those because I had a deeper responsibility. What I realized was like my mom, I was a mama's boy. And my mom was a straight A student, but she had a kid at 17 and she had me at 19. So, and I was like, my mom is smart. She's funny. She's 6'1". Like, she's athletic. I was like, my mom checked every box. Why? But we're on welfare. We're on food stamps. We're growing up poor. And then since I was a mama's boy, I said, I'm going to take care of my mama. But how am I going to take care of my mama? And why am I going to take care of my mama? The why was answered first because she didn't make it to where she wanted to make it. And having those two kids so young, she devoted all of her attention and time and focus to us. And I was like, this is why I'm going to pay her back. Because she could have been more, but she took the time and investment to make sure I am. So I'm going to pay her back. And I just created this ambition. Like, I, I would say that really what got me out of there is like, I knew I had to be greater than my greatest excuse. And I had a lot of excuses because I heard everyone else use them as excuses. And they weren't even just excuses. Sometimes there were reasons and realities why they still were there. And I looked around, I was like, I just can't come back with one of these excuses, reasons back to this reality. So my mother was my fuel, my jet fuel. Every time I started to doubt, started to feel it, and started to internalize it, I was like, nope, push it back out. You're doing this for mom. And so I just went on that journey because I knew there were more talented football players, better players, smarter students. I knew all those things. So I was like, but I'm, a, I'm not going to take no for an answer. I'm going to make it out of here, and I'm taking my family with me. We're going to make our dreams real. So you seem to object to me saying that you were tough because you're thinking of a younger boy. I'm thinking of the young man that goes from that to football. Mm. For, because that whatever whatever led to that you accepting the pain that I'm I'm seeing you wave your hands around people don't have any idea what you've done to those hands in <laughs> in pursuit like you can't tell me that your hands look like that yeah yeah and that you are not tough because in pursuit of your dreams you did that to your hands I know it's crazy too and there's so many moments Dan that how do you say I always tell people like. No one chooses football. Football chooses you, unless you're Dick Buckus, rest in peace, or Ray Lewis. I said, everyone else, football chose them. They did not choose football. It hurts every day, every way, but it's so rewarding. Um, but I chose football because it was my only expression that I saw that would take me to the next level. Uh, I ran track when I was really young, super fast, won nationals, won, set national records, like super fast. But I just, my mom was 6'1", 250, like Singletary. Like she was going, I was going to be a big boy, but it just took a while. And so I outgrew track, basically. Um, and football was it. But for me, I didn't have the deepest love for football. I used football as a vehicle. I was like, I'm going to drive this as far as I can, because you're right. It hurt. I mean, you're win it's a Wednesday, Dan. It's October. You're nine years old, and instead of riding your bike, playing your Nintendo, you're putting on thigh pads. And I was like, hell. But I was like, you got to chip in on this. You got to invest in your future. And I hated those moments. I loved the game. I loved playing. I loved how good I was. I loved all of that. I hated that process that the only way I can really see out of here is in that classroom and these thigh pads. I hated that I only thought and only saw those as options. And I saw football as the helicopter ride up and the slow play was going to be in the classroom. And then you got it, though. Like, you got it through Columbia. I don't know where... Yeah, you I, evidently you got to Columbia thinking still you were going to be a professional football player. Like, you know what all the math is against you. Uh, you know what you're up against, correct? But you're, you're, this is the path. You're going to go through Columbia to the NFL and be a professional football player. 
Yeah, you're a smart dude. That's why I always send you those texts. <laughs> um, I had to hedge my bet. I had to remember I said I can't come back with any excuse, reason back to this reality. And I I was like, I am a good football player. Yeah, I'm getting recruited by big schools. I could be another one of those who goes to the football factory. But I said, man, what if you don't make it? What would they look, what would they see in you in terms of perception? Will you still be a dumb jock to them? And I was like, man. So this is what happened. Um, Major school after major school after me, Columbia. And I'm like, oh, random. Uh, But I, at the time, I didn't even know what the Ivy League was. I didn't know about the Ancient Eight. I didn't know about their academic reputation, except Bill Cosby on the Cosby Show would wear the Harvard, Yale, Princeton sweaters. And then I found out, oh, Columbia is one of those schools in that league. <sighs> then I said, okay, here's the calculation. If someone pulls up to you in a Rolls Royce at the red light and you see them, you look at them, you're thinking to yourself they're doing well. Whatever that may be. It may not even be theirs, but you're just like, wherever that is, they're doing all right. Not knowing their situation for real. That's the top layer. And I said, but if I saw a guy on the bus, I would think, oh, not doing so well. All right, you're on the bus. But what if a billionaire got on the bus, you didn't know that? And what if a broke guy was just driving his boss's Rolls Royce around? And I just made this, like, perceptional decision like I need people to perceive me as intelligent because big black football player from Compton I just can see them now under their breaths if I don't make it dumb jock more more hurdles in front of me doors closed oh another football player who didn't make it now he wants to be a CEO etc and I was like why do I have to go through that process and so literally Columbia was going to give me the complexion of the intelligence that I wanted to be perceived. I wanted people to just, without, and it happened. It happened in life. No lie, Dan. You, you have double negatives in a sense. Ah, oh, he's just, oh, say something makes no sense. Ah, oh, he went to Columbia. I got the benefit of doubt all the time. And that's what I was really signing up to receive when I went to Columbia, is do not doubt me just because of what you see coming. And so those are some deeper dynamics that it, you know, I had to internalize from growing up in the situation that I did. The hedging of bets is you're saying, I need as many options as I can to out. And football is one of them. It might be unlikely, but also this will be a good school to go to. And still somehow it seems like somewhere in here, you tell me if I have this wrong, you're feeling somewhere like you're an underachiever because you got to these places in jockdom that come with great fanfare, and here you are at this age telling me, no, I wanted to be something better. I wanted to be something better to my kids than even that guy who I admired because <laughs> I, you understood how much glory and vanity and ego came from the world you conquered. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my deeper essence, my deeper mission is always to be, always has been to really inspire others, really to have a greater impact than just what I could have with my body. Um, but I needed my body to even get to the place where people could feel that impact. And it's crazy. My first interview, someone sent this to me maybe a year ago or so, I saw it. My first interview when I got in, uh, I got drafted to the Buffalo Bills. And I literally, the, the reporter's basically saying, so Marcellus, what do you want to do in your career? You know, you, you've been drafted. What are your goals? And I said, I want to be good enough and play long enough that my voice is loud enough so I can make a difference. And that's not the same <laughs> rookie speech that you hear from most guys that are getting drafted. Uh, in, in, in a nutshell, Dan, it was like almost, I was a kid that was like, damn, this is all I can do. Am I allowed to do? I'm going to do that. I'm going to do what I have to, to do what I want to. And that's where it, it started to go. Where'd you learn that though? Where, what, what age are you when you're learning that crossroads right there? I'm going to go really be me. 
I'm going to uh, answer my heart and not just take what everyone else tells me is a good enough life for me. Mm. It's 40, 40, 45. It's, it's having my son, having my two daughters, my youngest, family complete. And I think when you, you start to button that up and you start to say, okay, no more kids. Now let's secure this and let's envision what the future looks like for this. And then you're like, what is that? Is that more of the same? And it's like, I felt abandoned. Like I was away from what I wanted to do and I wasn't doing exactly what I could do where I was. And I was like, oh man, this is weird. And I I was fat and full, you know, I call it the velvet coffin. You know, you're getting those big checks in the direct deposit every two weeks. You're like, it just slows you back to sleep. And then my kids will wake me up with a question. My kids will wake me up with a need. And I'll just keep looking at them and I'm like, you're really going to tap out like this. So if I'm living this way because of comfort, just doing what I can do, imagine how I would live if I were challenged, if I actually leaned into the challenges that I know that I can actually overcome and conquer. So I think it was just my complete family, my wife looking at me, knowing me, and my kids needing me that made me have to come to that, that, that realization. Is, what about you? Because you're someone I look up to. And from my vantage point, I've seen a lot of dynamics and shifts with you. And I'm not just talking about in locale and occupation. It just seems like also in spirit and sentiments. What about you? Well, what have you seen? And I will answer your question, even though you're turning it back on me. But uh, <laughs> because I want to talk to you about love, uh, because what you're speaking of, and I'm not going to turn this, I will answer your question, mm -hmm. but because uh, I'm not going to avoid it. But I, because I do think that love is the starting point on all of this. What you've just described to me is somebody who felt like, by a very high standard, his own, that he was failing as a father and not being the husband that you thought your wife married and the man that she knows you to be because she loves you. So the love and the strength of that emboldens you. And I would say, same for me. I, uh, I found a woman who challenges me to be my, d my best self and d demands it in a way that is so loving and caring and understanding uh, only because she knows what I need for myself. Mm -hmm. And when you're buoyed from there, yeah. one of the things that I've admired from you is like, oh, this man's strong enough to know he needs to follow. He needs to follow here because this woman can open his heart yes. and reveal himself to himself in a way that the challenge is you must accept them, right? Mm -hmm. You must accept them. The degree of difficulty is who you are. That's who you've always been. And so I needed love to teach me that. Mm. Oh, that's... That is it, and that is a lot of what I felt. And I also had in front of me the other alternate experience. So I have four kids. Now watch these ages. 24, 8, 4, and 3. You all already know, two different mothers. Three kids from my wife now, one from baby's mother years ago. When you didn't know yourself. When I didn't know myself. When I'm checking all these boxes. When the kid from Compton is like, this is the way and this is it and everything's going to change. And once I move to the suburbs and I have three-level home and nine cars, everything's going to be great. And I look in the mirror and it's going to be silent or just nothing but peace because he's happy. And there were moments like that, but they were too infrequent. There were too many times where I was still seeking the next, needing more. And when I had my youngest daughter, so that's three years ago, that adds up to like the 45 year age. And I'm looking at her and all the moments in one day that she needed daddy from just the toys too far from her to uh, changing her to burping her. And I'm like, can't believe I missed so many of these moments from my oldest. And so, you know, her and I will sit back 
light a fire, sit in the backyard, and try to talk and just cry out because we both know we didn't connect like we could have, should have in so many of those moments. And I was a quote-unquote present father, which is a whole different conversation because it's different from being a present father and then being in the home as a nuclear family, nuclear father. But I missed them, Dan. And then now I had them. And that was just another wake-up call to never let them go. So you've made choices about who you are. And so when you direct the question at me, I have. I am trying a business venture on my own. And you can speak uh, uh, directly of what the challenges are, no matter how much you have built up your brand. Mm -hmm. When you leave and go out on your own, there's a fight to, to be waged in this space over personality-driven podcasts. There are a thousand people at a thousand uh, microphones. You have one yourself. Forgive me. Let's, yes. let's plug it now. Never shut up. <laughs> uh, okay, so forgive me because I want the people to know who you are. That's one of the reasons I wanted to do this mm. with you um, because from Appreciate way back, you were we were during a different time. We had you on as the love doctor, yes. giving, us, giving us relationship advice at a time I'm guessing that you probably didn't know yourself or – your wife would tell me what a fool that guy was. <laughs> what a fool. And But I, admi I admired him because uh, he knew everything. That uh, guy was wise about relationships. <laughs> he knew more about winning than any of us. <laughs> He's stronger than us. He's cooler than us. Yes. Um, and it, it seems to me like you have had to make choices on behalf of who you are now, at least in part, correct? And I don't want to speak for you because of who she knows you to be. Mm -hmm, exactly. As a father, like it's the man she loves. Yes. The, the, man she, the man she loves had to go out on his own and fight for not predicting the Jets result that week because <laughs> that's not the point of having these microphones and it's not the point of doing everything you did in conquering two worlds, a broadcasting world and a football world. And I don't know which one was harder for you. Mm, great, great, great assessment on it all. And my wife slapped me in the head inadvertently when my son was like two months old. And so, little man, loving life. I'm working with Max at the time. We're doing our radio show and Sports Nation. Uh, I lived at downtown Ritz-Carlton, right above ESPN LA downtown. So, one minute commute walking uh, right across the hall. And I'm just, everything's convenient, everything's great. I got my son, I'm loving life, let's go. And this was the first time I saw a stop sign. So I went out, I was hanging out, guys in the buildings. And since I live so close and work so close, everything's so close, ah, whatever. So LA, it shuts down at two o'clock. I get home, three, whatever. And go to bed, like 3.30, gotta be up at six. Why do I have to be up at six? Because my wife is like, uh-uh, you knew that you had to be up. This your shift for little man. If he wakes up at six, you're playing with him. And it wasn't no rollover. Come on, baby. You know, last night I was out. It was like, nope. And Dan, there was this temptation. And I know this, this how to, how to, how to rig it. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the door lock babysitter. So you go into a room with a baby. You lock the door. Make sure it's childproof. Let the baby play. You sleep next to the baby, right? I've seen the trick a thousand times, right? I didn't. This is my first boy. My daughter, she's way older. So it's like, damn, all right. And then I was thinking about doing it. And I was like, nah. I said, now, nah, this is the challenge. That was the challenge. Would you wake up and be present with your son right now? Because he wants you, doesn't care about anything else. That always sticks in my, my head like, oh. And I answered that challenge. I actually stayed up. It was painful. All of the above. Took a nap later. But I knew then alterations, edits. Start leaning into who you are. You're going to still do this? What, you're going to be the 19th year NFL veteran, even though you're retired, Al Bundy type, still living, hanging, chilling? Or are you going to really lean into what's real and lean into what's right for you? So that started me on that mission that day, two months after he was born. When I didn't mail it in that moment, I actually responded to it. There's real wisdom in this, right? In learning all of a sudden in the presence of that, oh, my life is, my life cannot be most completely my own unless I live in service of, of this group of people who have taught me what real love is so Say that, it. so that the happiest I will be on this earth is with this group of people who bring me the greatest joy that reside beyond football conquers and 
money and joy and in the places that people tell you joy is to be found. Yeah, all of that, man. And and it's crazy, Dan. Oh, because I literally grew up dreaming of all those things as the answers and the antidotes to all the ills that I had present day. And then when you get it, now I know why Puffy said more money, more problems. What he really meant is, even if you got money, you're still going to have problems. <laughs> like, not more and more. It's just like, you think that you're going to get rid of them with a check. It won't happen. And so I came to that realization. And I just knew I had to lean into what was forward for my children and my family. That made my decision to leave broadcast media in the traditional form a lot easier than people think. Uh, people don't know the beats of it. I don't necessarily always unveil it, or I do it sporadically, kind of asteroids, so they kind of like get a piece here, get a piece there. But it was a it was a long, tedious process of me changing on the inside and the industry changing on the outside. Well, let's unravel that for a second. Let's because go. Because, I no, I'd like to take me down the path of what it is that you're untangling as you're trying to come through the thicket of, it's going to be harder to do this by myself. I know that, but I have to do it by myself because it's the only honest, authentic way I can possibly do it. Not bought by anybody. I'm going to... I'm. I'm going to try and do it on my own in ways that honor who my family thinks I am. Yeah. Now, walk with me here. Remember, I'm the kid that was like, okay, got to hedge my bet, basically give myself the highest safety net. Got to go to Columbia. I know I want to go to these other schools. My friends certainly do. But I was like, nah, dog, I got to go here just for the perception. Get to the NFL, play 10 years. All of a sudden, I, I skip the line, go ahead of a lot of players who wanted the same gig, and I got the gigs. But if you look and squint at my, my broadcast career, you start to realize, damn, you had a lot of co-hosts. You worked with everyone. And that, that started off, it's a Michelle Beto, it's a Carissa Thompson, it's a Max Kellerman, it's a Jason Whitlock, it's a Manuel Acho, Kerry uh, Champion, LZ Granderson, I mean El Hassan, yada da mean, all... Everybody. And what it told me is that the universe whispers before it yells. And all these changes, I was winning, but more in my world, losing by law of association. Because everyone was seeing a piece of me as a teammate to someone else, but seeing different pieces and never seeing me in fullness. So I'm like, I'll say the same thing. You say it with Jason Whitlock it lands differently than if you say it with Max Kellerman. I'll say the same thing, Michelle Beadle, it lands differently when you say it with Kerry Champion. And I was like, why am I getting taken? Me, the persona, not even me, my identity, just the persona. Why am I getting taken all across this landscape in terms of who he is, what is he really about, who is he, when I'm like, I'm me. I'm the guy that can work with anybody because I'm good with everybody. But that wasn't really the summation. So that was part of it as well. And I think the last part of it was the fact that the opportunities in front of me, it was a challenge. They said, basically, look, we could keep you fat and full in this velvet coffin, or dare I say, you bet on yourself. Just like I bet on myself when I went to Columbia, but I still could make it to the NFL. I was like, I've made that bet before. And leaving Columbia, this is what gave me the confidence, Dan. No one knows this, but when I was graduating uh, in our school paper, they wrote up the salaries that they knew of all the graduating seniors. And, of course, I was number one. I got drafted. And then in that article, they also wrote that the Ivy League was now going to have their third active player in the NFL, me but the Ivy League had six owners in the NFL. And that hit me like, I am not going to get caught up. I am going to bet on my brain, not on my body. But <laughs> still got to do what I need to do to do what I want to do. And I kept going. Any asteroids missing there that you're not telling us, that you're trying to avoid, just so that I have a complete picture, because 
I didn't believe I was whispering to you in that cafeteria. I don't know how you received what it is. It might have been it. I will tell you that in it, in what I felt like was a spiritual moment for me, I was overstepping my bounds. I did not. <laughs> I did not know you that way. Right, right. I I'd, I'd read articles about you that made me feel like I I knew a little bit because of how much you revealed about what your physical pain was. Yeah. Uh, in having a surgery that tore your abdomen apart and and the, what you were describing was so excruciating to me that I felt like I knew a little bit a person um, who was in there who had shown me glimpses of himself in the broadcast and I was telling you flatly, not whispering it, they don't know how to use you. Not with co-hosts, not with like this. You need a couple of things here just so that you could be your maximum self, but they have to feel like support to you, not like you need to get along with everybody because you're not the talent here. Yes, yes, yes. Let's talk through that. Uh, ah. So in real time, present time, it's a compliment. Like, okay, you have your own show. Now your show is with Michelle Beto. Amazing. Your show's with Max. All these names. Great, great, great. And I was like, I work well with them, but I work better in a different setting and in a different environment in a different format, but it's not this one. So it's like, now what do you do? Because I don't have the power to create that, what I'm talking about, nor do I really have the deep intel of what that is, but I know it's not this. Um, so I didn't want to slap the compliment away of thank you for this job. Thank you for this show, et cetera. But uh, behind my eyes, it was a slow death in terms of my brain cells based on the subject matter, you know. And I was entertaining people. It's fun. But it wasn't making me get any greater in terms of my identity, my essence, my impact, the things that mattered more to me. So I was just basically having a job that was satisfying, um, but not gratifying. And I hated that. And a couple of my bosses started to sniff that. And they were like, what do you really want to do? And I told them, in this last round of contract talks, I kept saying deeper. And I knew that was going to get met with resistance because that's not the model. And I was like, I, I just can't do water skiing monkeys and I can't do Dak sucks or is Dak top five like every other top. I just can't. And I don't want that to come out like those who do are bad for doing it. But I'm me and they're them. So. Oh, but it sounds like you also realize, okay, um, I'm keeping my fame alive. I'm keeping pieces of my identity alive. Nobody has any idea how hard it is to retire as a football player physically broken and look at the landscape that is the rest of your life that you're going to limp through in a great deal of pain because of what the sport did to you. People can't understand. I don't even know what's harder getting to the NFL or retiring mm -hmm. from the NFL. When I, when I look at both of those things, you can answer that question. Yeah. Look, I, I was fortunate, but I will talk for those who aren't and weren't as fortunate. When I got drafted to Buffalo, I remember hanging out with all my boys. All of them were straight yellow brick road to Wall Street, become analysts, work 25 hours a day. That's what their life was to become successful. And they all became successful, but boy, was it a grind. And I remember we were pounding a few drinks and just talking and laughing. And I was like, you know what the best part about being drafted is right now? And they're like, what? I was like, I don't have to think about what I want to do next. You guys had to. And I know some of them didn't figure it out. I was like, damn, it's the same thing when you're retiring from the NFL. I had ESPN waiting for me. It took a few months for me to, to make it work, but I had something. Those guys, man, when they're done, then the light goes off for some of them. Remember that whole perception, the Rolls Royce and this and that? It's not even that they're not intelligent, they're not smart enough, and they're just wrapped in the packaging that's going to be labeled this. And I didn't want to be wrapped in that package. So that's where the Columbia paid off. And then talking to them, man, it's, for me, I, had, I always had something waiting on me. 
But if I didn't, and I know what that feels like because I've had those conversations with those guys, that's scary. And especially when you're 30-something years old and you're thinking you got 40, 50, 60 more years and no answers, just questions. Yeah, that's devastating, bro. Yeah, but you get to all of the things and then aren't quite fulfilled. You're you're still empty. You're holding on to the paychecks that keep you famous. Hey, he's Marcellus Wiley, former NFL great uh, broadcaster for a long time. He's been on my television talking for many years. That's mm -hmm. a name I know. He has turned a career that was excellent, above average by any standard. Mm -hmm. He planned for a broadcasting career, mastered that as well, and is feeling something empty very soon because at... No I mean, with Max, I felt like I got a lot of your personality. I felt like I saw more of you with, with Max than I saw with anybody. I, I felt like I saw real genuine friendship and love there, understanding. Uh, I thought that was the best partner, and no offense to anybody else, but that was, that, that was the best chemistry I saw with anybody. Absolutely. It was the best chemistry. Um, in, in, in large part is because we have a lot of similarities in terms of how we look at life, family first, uh, our affinity for learning, uh, hip hop, uh, beefing, clowning. Like we just like, you know, brothers from another in that respect. You love him. Oh yeah. Cause he's a smart dude. He's like, and he's a real dude. And he really helped me through some really painful moments. Uh, he helped reconcile my father and I, we had it, a strained relationship for a few years there. On air, we're reconciling this. Like, we're not off air, like, just vibing bruhs. Like, on air, the death of my former teammate, Junior Seau. Many moments where I was really emotional. And sometimes in despair, Max and I talked that out on air. Uh, vulnerable. I guess that's what it is for both of us. Um, vulnerable. Um, and, you know, no slight, like you said, to any of the co-hosts, because I, I grabbed something from everybody, but I do have a BCS ranking, and uh, Max was number one for sure. That said, um, what I had still unfulfilled was I wanted to be a school teacher, and people laughed at me. And literally my fallback plan was if I didn't make it to the NFL from Columbia, I was going to go to L.A. Unified School District and teach kids. Now, people were smacking that around and making some sense. They were like, dog, you're not going to grade 35 papers on the state capitals every day. I was like, you're right. <laughs> so principal, dean, something with kids. And that's what I was always in pursuit of. Where can I go to educate, entertain, and still flex all my muscles? So what I'm doing now is trying to rig sports media, lifestyle, entertainment culture, uh, how we communicate in a way that has a positive lace to it, uh, educational base to it, but it's still entertaining. Like you're basically giving them their medicine in the candy, and I'm trying to do that. Well, you can teach people a lot of things about a lot of different subject matter, but I'd like to go back to something that you said with some chest on Max uh, and some pride. You said vulnerable. We had a relationship that was vulnerable. Where have you learned wisdoms about the value of the best relationships always having that? Oh, man. The experience speaks for itself in terms of I'm a firm believer to give is to get. So if I want to get this love, I got to give this love. If I want to get this openness and freedom, I got to give it. And I'm like that all the time. And then I read the room, I read my personnel, know thy personnel, and I realize not everyone is receptive of that. And Max was. Uh, Max was vulnerable as well. Uh, his father being a shrink, uh, him going through life experiences, and the, bro the death of his brother, all those kind of things left him vulnerable. Um, always thinking, curious. And nuanced and ready to discuss. Like, I'm not a natural debater. I hate that because I'm like, I got to pick a side. Just reminds me of my childhood, Crip or Blood. I'm like, neither. Now that's a gang because now you got to avoid both of them. And I'm like, oh, God. I hate, I hate binary choices. I hate, I hate a world where you got to love something or hate it. I hate it all that. I'm like, I avoided that my whole childhood, picking which side of the street. 
And now you're going to make me do that in occupation or in rhetoric? I was like, this is silly. So what well, Max and I, we had a chemistry where if it's something we're thinking about, let's talk about. And it was just that simple, man. And that led us to get into places where I wasn't with any other co-hosts. And um, I think the audience felt the same way. Most fun you've had professionally? Most fun. Just when you think of that, is there anything else? I'm taking football in there, too. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> De define fun again. <laughs> uh, What's I, rating? I, I'm talking about the greatest connection that you have had anywhere <laughs> along your life with a brother or a friend who, along the path, uh, work was fun because he was he was there oh man that's 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 yeah he's he's certainly in the college football playoffs for that <laughs> yes absolutely uh they're all like different levels of fun because i had a different level of conscious and consciousness at that time like oh man i i'm pre-social media nfl it's hard to get more fun than that, y'all. Okay, I, fair <laughs> enough, fair enough, fair enough. And I got all the receipts it's, Okay, up here. fair enough. Uh, I was trying to make it a love story between you and Max, and you're like, no, I played professional football. Do you have any idea how wonderful my life was? Oh, uh, insane. Fair enough. But uh, when, when I ask you about the people who have imprinted you, uh, insisting that you be better, uh, I don't know where your ambition comes from. I don't know uh, why it is you're built the, the way that would make you achieve all the things and then somehow judge yourself as ha still having underachieved. I don't know mm. where any of that comes from. I do. I do. I do. It comes from, you know this, looking at your uh, balance sheet from your financial advisor. I remember not having money growing up and you have a bank account. Then you one day get enough money where you got a CPA, you're meeting with all these financial advisors, and they're talking way deeper than you know, but you got to trust in someone. And that's the experience of the young athlete, but the second generation athletes now obviously going to have a leg up. But I remember getting my first statement, and I remember seeing this line said, unrealized gains. And I was like, oh, what's that? I was like, that's the money you could have, but we're not going to touch that. We're not going to mess with that, but that's what you could have. I grew up in a community, and it started with my mom looking at her every single day in every single way as unrealized gains. Like, she could have, but she never did. And so what I now base myself on is did I do all that I could and I can because I know what she was incapable of doing and didn't allow herself to do. So that's always like my reflection. It's like, and it's not a burden. People think like sometimes when I talk, they're like, oh man, you're tortured. I'm like, nah, B. I just know that I have a deep motivation that I have now aggregated all of the unrealized gains of my family. And I'm gonna make sure I make that imprint in this world. Did I hear blame for your mother in there? Because you're saying she could have and it was unrealized. And I would think that there would be a whole ton of variables that you're expecting her to overcome there that might be very difficult to overcome. But you're expecting them because that's where the greatest love resides. And that's what you demand of yourself as a as a Wiley. Oh, yeah. You must have been in our house. When I when I be uh, a teenager, I started to not rebel, but have dialogue, let's say deeper dialogue, uh, really vocal dialogue with my mother, like, okay, mom, 17 and 19, you had us. We're 13 and 15 now. Your turn to live. Mom was like, oh. It was just like to get old Betsy started, to get the car started, it was tough for her. So she ended up being a postal worker, but she was so much greater in my eyes, so much grander in my eyes, but that's what she became, and I loved her for that. But I always used to challenge her and say, what do you really want to do? Because that's what you're just doing. So then in that conversation, when you're playing that tug of war, you start to realize the grip you have. You start to realize your strength because you're making sense because now you're seeing your mom become vulnerable. You're starting to see her weaknesses. You're starting to see her run into her challenges and stopping. And all that empowered me. All of that made me say, it's my turn. 
because I see what my mom did well and I see what my mom fell short in. And instead of using that against her, I'm going to use that for me. And so, yeah, we used to have those discussions. And I was like, and that's why one of my mantras is be greater than your greatest excuse because we all have them. But my mom could have easily turned the corner and became more if she wanted more, but she loved what she was. And then I make it to the NFL and it's a wrap. Like she, <laughs> she, she, she beyond the proudest mama ever, right? Dat mama. I'm dat dude, she dat mama. And I'm like, oh my God, this is the craziest thing in the world. And I let her live, man. I let her live until she passed away in 2005, breast cancer. Where does the dialogue go when you're thinking about your own kids? Uh, because I, it, if I can dare to assume that I know anything about you, I'm guessing that your mission is to be of the greatest service to them in every way that you could possibly be, or you will have failed. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Fully motivated, fully dedicated, all in. Um, it's weird. I just want them to have the engine. Uh, this is something and we, I used to talk about all the time. With Max, we used to talk about, I want them to have the hardware so that the world could apply any software and they're able to run efficiently. Give them anything because their hardware is built up. And that's why it's so important that I attack the sensibilities of today's media culture, messaging, whatever's coming at them it seems like we have fewer decoders out there than I desire, let's just say that. Uh, I wish we had more people who would say it the way it really is, say it the way that we all need to hear it. Uh, I'm very blunt, very direct, but I do it with a smile, so maybe it is received differently, but I wish we had more people that just told these kids which way is up, instead of saying, no, it doesn't matter, wherever you wanna go, Whichever way you want to, that's the way it is. And that's the problem. I think that you and Max need to get back together and you need a, a partner, uh, not because you have to have a partner, but somebody who can live in service of some of the things that you are in making some of the things you make because they believe the same things that you do. I don't know that, uh, uh, the, maybe you can explain it to the people. I don't know that they understand the labyrinth that you had to navigate mm. in broadcasting to now, I'm guessing, be able to speak most freely and authentically about yourself in a time in America where your voice has some wisdom in it as things around us um, collapse. Yes, yes. Uh, the, the, the whole journey, I mean, you're doing shows, you're loving it, you're on the road here and there, and it all was... It all was simpler back then in terms of the topics. Uh, the whole agenda seemed like just to entertain and educate fans. But from a reality base that is now much looser than it was even 10 years ago. Um, I got into it because I love to translate the message, translate the experience of what it was to be a professional athlete. Simple as that. I was like, I'm, this is me being a school teacher. Yeah, I could do it, but I'm going to do it on a desk and I'm going to do it with a suit on and I'm going to just talk to people with video. Yes, I'm a teacher still, but I'm teaching them what sports really feels like and looks like. And then you start to realize, oh, wait a minute. You're going to have to make a choice, bruh. Either you're going to have to get in one of these circus tents and, and do a little more theatrics or it's not going to... You're not going to be all pro. Let's just say that. You be on the team, you can make a player here, but you ain't going to be all pro. Um, so are there inauthentic versions of yourself that are now performing on television in a way that feel like in any way soul-selling to you because you have to be not just your most, you're trying to be your most authentic self and there are elements of this that are performative. Like you have to yeah. put on a, a show and I, I don't know, did you think you were compromising or... Or, or selling out in some way by, by trying to do television the way you were being taught to do television? No, and that's part of why uh, a Dan Lebatard comes up to me and say, says they're not using you like the way that they should. And I'm sitting there realizing that I'm not at the top of the mountain in sports media because I'm not built to do what's necessary to do. 
and become that guy or those guys up there. Like you said, it's performative. It's, and it's not a slight. It's just like, I'm not doing that. But there is a commonality between all those who are at the top, whether it's based on the, the business model, economic model, or just how they do it in performance, that none of those guys, the Skips, Stephen A., uh, Colin, uh, like traditional media make the most, uh, they, play, they play. They didn't play. They didn't have that investment. So that gives them, I think, a detachment that allows them to activate their performance even more than me. I feel inhibited. I feel restricted because of my investment, because of the reality base I'm coming from, right? So it, it happens in everything. Like when I, I have a foundation, Project Transition, we work with the underserved in the community. A lot of people have that same mission statement to work with them, give them resources. A lot of times people come in, big Rolodex, big brain, big heart, but not big in experience. They theorize on it. And I'm like, well, let me help you out because I'm bilingual. I speak have and I speak have not. I can tell you that what you're saying sounds good, maybe feels good, but won't be the most impactful. So I, say, I saw that happening in sports media. I was like, whoa, what's happening is there's a choice you got to make. and You're going to activate. And working with Emmanuel Acho at the end made me realize, let me slide to the left and let him Keep on going, because his ambition was the greatest I've ever seen, in part because he's the youngest guy I ever worked with. But he wanted to be a star so much and so hard. <laughs> I was like, it's almost like the NFL where you're like, this is why you retire, because that 21-year-old is going to run through walls that you're not going to run through, and you're not going to do what he's going to do. And whether you can do it or not is not the question. You ain't going to do it. And I was just like, I need to move on. And that's when the opportunities uh started to present themselves elsewhere, and I started to look elsewhere. That's an interesting way of looking at it. I didn't know that happened with Acho. You say it uh, not bitterly, somewhat gently. It's the business. It's the game. Like, um, I, you understood that that he was going to do things on the way to stardom that you weren't willing to with the take? Um, look, I was not bitter, and I'm not bitter at what he did. And a lot of people want me to be bitter at what he did. I said, no, I'm not. Now, how he did it, that's the conversation if you want to have that. Um, so this is how it went at Fox. I get there. Jason Whitlock's recruiting me. He's coming to my backyard a couple of times. I worked with him before. One of this family show, Deeper, got me on the word Deeper. I was hooked then. Go there. We worked for t together for two years. Then he just goes. He's done. He just leaves. Now, a lot of people don't know that he, they wanted him to stay. They were working on his contract for a long time. It didn't work out. The terms, whatever they may have been, uh, and the power, I think. like Because Whit Whitlock wanted even more. He did a lot for that show. He led the show, uh, designed the show. He did the topics, all that. And I love working on that show. So I won't slight that in any respect. But I knew a long time ago, months before he left, that he was potentially leaving. He never told me. Then he just left and never told me he <laughs> We still boys to this day, but I was like, dog, you could at least just gave me the heads up. But I found out. So remember this, Dan. So I have a co-host who leaves in the middle of the night, but I already knew it was coming, so I was prepared. Nick Khan, my guy, Cobra, uh, calls me up. Hey, I got an opportunity. I'm going to take a swing for the fences, and you got to do those things sometimes. I was like, oh, yeah, go get it. And we know how this that is, turned But out. this is a super agent you're talking about. When you say Nick Khan, you're talking about a star maker. You knew how much power he had at ESPN and beyond. Nick Khan is, is saying, I, as your agent, can now shoot you into real stardom where you can be your deepest self. Well, whoa, no. What he's saying is, I'm leaving the agent business, going to WWE to run it as a president. Then he got promoted. Then he, I mean, it's just... Oh, he wow. Went. Okay. He left. So Whitlock leaves... He leaves, and I'm sitting there like, the universe whispers before it yells. And I'm like, damn. All right, so I don't have an agent my last two years on purpose. I'm, everyone's calling. I'm like, nope, nope, nope. Because really, I got got one foot out or at least pointing in a different direction. Let's see how this plays out. I get Acho, and Acho and I are working together all great. But a few weeks into it, like just from hello, like I've known Acho for years, uh, 
uh, met him before, uh, kind of like in a more of a like, I'm in the industry, he wasn't, he was just leaving school and we stayed in touch, knew him from one, his ex-girlfriend, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, all right, you imagine working with somebody a few weeks and then you get a call. And I got a call from two people, boss and a coworker. Hey, what's going on with your show? I was like, what do you mean? Acho trying to do another show with some his brother and all these other cats and trying to get you out. Man, we good. I tucked that away because that's who I am. I'm not going to hold that against you. But I'm going to watch. Remember, I just went through this with Whitlock. <laughs> so we basically went almost two years of him giving me the dap in my face, but behind working. And I didn't put up any resistance because we weren't fighting for the same thing. So... When it was time to move on, I wasn't mad at what he did because I was like, I can't go to coach and say, hey, coach, give me the ball more if you want to give him the ball more. It wasn't that kind of dynamic. He wanted what I had, what we had. Now, if he would have went about it like Max did with first take, as soon as Max got the call from Stephen A., Max like, Marcellus, what's up? I was like, dog, what you think? And I was like, well, what you think? And we went back and forth many a times. That's what I wanted. I didn't get that out of Whitlock. I didn't get that out of Acho. And I wasn't mad at either one for what that was, but just how it was. And that leaves you feeling that you've arrived in a place in broadcasting where you have to make a choice now, right? The things that have happened in your career, you're saying the game's not for me anymore. I'm not willing to fight over Jets Patriots. Who's going to have the strongest take? I want to do something else with my life. But now this, I would say, is hard, but you're telling me it's not that hard because you've been calling? Like, you've been... Yeah. The whispers, you can no longer ignore the whispers or the shouts. Yeah, my, my deep spirit is just telling me, why would you want to fight Whitlock? And I'm under contract then, so it was like, whatever. Why would you want to fight Acho for something you don't want to fight for? So you're going to get into this tussle with them, and it's not that serious to you. Now that's just your ego. Or you just scared to really take the challenge of being who you're really supposed to be. So in a lot of ways, I thank both of them for what they did. Now, the ultimate thanks is going to be in my success in the next endeavor, which I'm a part of now, would never shut up and brings TV, reach TV, et cetera. But the point of it is, it took me back to my Columbia moment when there were a lot of naysayers and there was a lot of craziness going on with my decision. And I was like, I'll, I'll, I'll come back and prove it in success. So I wasn't bitter because they just kind of gave me a jetpack in the way I was going anyway. Oh, but I would say, and I do not underestimate what your life has been because uh, you have learned a lot of things. But I would dare say that the challenge presently in front of you is almost as challenging as any of the challenges oh. you've had in front of you because doing it yourself mm -hmm. at this point in your career because your heart demands you must. Yes. It, it's made easier by the calling, but it's hard. <laughs> it is beyond hard. Um, and it's like I'm, I'm used to it, and I'm like, why am I back here again? I'm 48 years old taking on these type of challenges, like walking in the weight room trying to bench press 500 again. You know, I'm back there again. And it's like, why? And I was like, because there's still game to play. And I still haven't conquered it like I know I can. And as crazy as this is going to sound, Dan, I wasn't the smartest kid, but obviously I was smart. I wasn't the best football player, but obviously I could ball. Wasn't the best broadcaster, but obviously I could talk. But what I'm on now in terms of impact and trying to help people, I got a chance. That's, that's where my muscles, that's what I've been ultimately designed for. So with that, thankfully, I'm not doing this by my damn self. <laughs> Having a partner, um, when the contract talks were going on, I'm talking to all the different outlets out there, everybody, even some of the other majors. Um, I got an opportunity. So John Brinkis, former sports science host, uh, we partnered in Brinks TV. What that allowed me to have is ownership, equity, something that I can give to my kids. Something that is very important to me is to not 
tell my kids that here's your money or find out, figure out who you are without anything of legacy, without anything built into it. So you know how it goes at working at Fox ESPN, which is amazing. But once you're done talking, all you could do is, hey, hey kids, <laughs> this is what daddy saved from you. No, oh, save for you. And I was like, golly, I want my kids to be a part of a legacy, be part of something of ownership that daddy gave them to start off with, not just, okay, go figure it out with what daddy has left over. And it was a, just a different mind play. It was a different skill set that I knew that I had to start to activate or else, frankly, I was going to take my kids back to the same situation I was in, just dressed up differently. Well, tell me, because I'd like the vantage point of what you saw, and if you rem remember the look in the eyes of your children when you recognized that what was looking back in their eyes is our dad is fat and happy. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. And you know what? Now let's have some therapy. It takes me back to those challenges I had with my mom where I'm like, Mom, you could do more. And I didn't want my kids to see me in a position where, Daddy, you could do more. Daddy, you don't care if Dak is top five, top ten, <laughs> do you? I was like, no. I mean, like, he, he topped something. Got a football field in his backyard. And he got $200 million. You know, like, he's topped something. And I was just, like, looking at my kids and looking at my reality and looking at the fact that I have not yet fully flexed my muscles and people don't understand what that means, but you got to know what that feels like. Imagine people are giving you cheers and love, and you're like, that's 70% of me, 80% of me. And I'm like, what if they saw all of me? How would they take that? And that challenge is, is, is ever-present. You, you right now, you're building your own company. Tell me your challenges, like... You had to confront this same, this same moment, this same conversation you had to have. What are those challenges? I can give you like an endless unspooling of challenges <laughs> that I did not expect mm. that include the idea of having 44 employees and feeling a real and genuine responsibility mm. to like build, I don't have kids, to, to build something for people that I care about that that can exist as a media thing in Miami, that the whole thing's collapsed. Like, the whole media shit is collapsed. You've seen it. Mm -hmm. You've seen how few seats there are. Absolutely. And so in Miami, there exists a thing that has, you know, that can have some vibrancy and some love in it. Um, but, like, the challenge is, I can give you a thousand of them, but I don't have a greater one than this. And you've, I've seen it in myself in the couple of times that you've hit the word present, uh, needing to be present. I love my wife. My wife has taught me all of these things. I want to be the best man for her, and I want to love her the best that I can. I want to be with her. I want to be present all the time. I want to be there. Yeah. Doesn't mean I don't want to work. Doesn't mean I don't get identity in my work. Doesn't mean, like, yeah, like, yes, I, I'm proud that I've built something that is good, but I want it to now live in service of me, not me in service of it. Yes, yes. And I don't know, how do I untangle that one? Because... Because I want to untangle that one. I think the greatest joy is to be able to share this with with everybody, all of it, mm. all, all of it. But but with her, like I want to be with her. She's she's done all this with me the, the last three years. Like she's she's she knows the battering I'm taking. Yeah, talk about that untangling it is that hit home. I ran this simulation because I was trying to untangle it as well. One, I was trying to figure out, do I go forward? Do I stop? Uh, do I just accept it as is? This is a lot of mailbox money, direct deposits that you're just going, they're going to cease. And in the process of untangling it, I had a simulation at home. Uh, one of the offers for me was to go to New York City. And I was like, all right, do a show in New York City. First things first. I was like, all right, let me, let me run the stray hand plan in my life. Now, I'm not straight hand, right? So I'm like, all right, I have three little ones here. You could pull off, you could pull off straight hand. You could pull off all of the things straight hand and with real depth 
yeah. with, with Oprah real depth. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I meant in terms of his family dynamic, like not married, older kids and the teenagers, whatever it may be. I was like, I'm not that. So I get where he can go cross country every week during football season. I'm not, I'm not that, but let's see. I call it the stray hand plan. That's the homie. So I'm like, let me see if I could do it. So literally, Dan, the next day after that op opportunity was presented, I was like, all right, go downstairs, 6 o'clock in the morning. My wife wakes up at 4.30 every day, works out by 6 o'clock. I was like, this time, I'm just a fly on the wall. Three little kids and her, you know, potentially I'll be going all week and then I'll come back home with the money. Let's see how this goes. And at 6 o'clock, <laughs> my daughter's tripped on the stairs uh, then my boy comes down. He wants breakfast early. And literally, my wife is on her spin bike. And the mother daughters sleep upstairs. And I'm like, oh, no. And you, lifelong overachiever, have a, a mess on your hands that you can't handle. Yes. And then it's too much for you. It's overwhelming. <laughs> and I'm like. You can't do it. I was like, there's no way I can leave this family be present. Can't leave this family. Leave my wife. Leave this. And. Scratch that scab that I had for my oldest, my 24-year-old, and once again, not be there in those intimate moments. So what helped me untangle it, like as you were talking about your challenge, is I just dropped the rope. And that's when I was like, I'm leaving broadcast media. I'm still talking. I'm still listening. I'm still going back and forth engaging, but I'm leaving that. I am going to do this on my terms, and at least in terms of locale, and make sure I can stay still and do this and be present for my family. Scratch that scab. I don't know the depths of what you're feeling there. Do you, do you feel like uh, you, you, you were not ready as a father to be a father when you had to be a father? Oh, no. Um, compared to me now, that guy, <laughs> yeah, he was good then, but boy... He's a whole different animal now. But, I mean, look, I was 24 uh, in Buffalo playing football. Still had seven, eight years to play. By schedule alone, you're not there. By our relationship status, because we broke up, I'm not there. She moved cross country. I'm in L.A. No matter how much I was there in the summers and she was here in the summers and breaks and holidays, it doesn't add up. Because there are a million decisions needed as a parent every single day. And I miss so many of those millions of decisions. So that's the scab. And, you know, that's my regret is that I couldn't make that work where I could be there with her. And I know that's something that's a, a, really a, a telling story of today's society of so many people in broken homes or both parents not there, single family homes. And I just really want to highlight not from the parents' perspective, because I looked at it that, that way forever. Like, oh, man, her and I, and then my baby. Think about that kid. How many times they can't call out your name because you're not there. Or they know not to call out your name because it won't be received well in that same home. Look what that does to a kid with a blank canvas and how it colors it darker than it should be. And that's what I was like, <laughs> The last thing I want to do is send me a video of MJ in the game. How'd he do? When I had an opportunity to not do that. And it was tough because I had to give up a lot. But I'm investing in myself. And I think that's going to be my greatest reward. You blame yourself there? Or there, there is there shame for you there? Because the, the standard you have is an exacting one. I don't know how forgiving you are of yourself. <laughs> Damn, you know me. Um, I'm not forgiving, um, but I don't blame myself either. Uh, you know, it took it took us both to get to that reality. Um, and we're on great terms now. We just missed of her 18 years growing up. You know, you add up the days and the moments, and they all seem like, for, you know, they seem like I was always there. But there was a lot that I wasn't, you know. And so I, I'm regretful of that. Um, but... No, I don't blame myself because I've always been a good guy. Even when I was in the league and I was just the love doctor. Like those, those anecdotes, all those experiences came from me being so cool that I got to meet everybody in the room. 
every girl in the room. Like, no matter what. Like, I wasn't, no one's ever throwing a drink in my face. No one ever cursed me out. No, no, no. Well, you navigated, you navigated both worlds very well, very expertly. Like, I don't, uh, which, which one do you regard as, like, stranger? The <laughs> broadcasting or, or football? Broadcasting by far. Uh, by far. Look, neither one is a meritocracy. Uh, we like to say sports is. It's the closest thing we have to it maybe now, but it's it's loose now, even sports. Uh, and certainly uh, broadcast is like untethered now. <laughs> it's almost like forget it, like whatever. If you know someone, if your agent is so-and-so, you know so-and-so, you willing to go there, it's, it's pretty much uh, triple sevens. Um, Oh I, I, wow! You know how Hollywood all of this is. Like your your take on on what the take industry has become is, you're looking at it as rotted at the core. Like, ooh, that's that's ugly. How Hollywood took that over, and now it's just all professional wrestling. Yeah, yeah, it, it totally is. And look, and I was there from hello, uh, 2008 first meeting. I remember us getting into about this new thing called Twitter, and it's all the executives and all the uh, the, the host and. All the analysts, and we're sitting there, and they're like, all right, okay, this Twitter thing, we got to be careful with it. We can't give away all our information. We can't tell them everything that's going to happen on the show. Be very protective. Be private, but just try to gain audience. And then literally like a year or two later, they're like, okay, tell them your whole show. They'll still come watch. We need both audiences. I was like, do y'all know which way is up? Do y'all have a any projections, any forward thinking? And I was like, all right, whatever. Um, I saw the same thing happen when I was leaving the industry. I literally left ESPN and wanted to go to Fox and wanted to do a radio show. I love radio. I love how you, you get the intimacy and the response from the audience. And they were like, no, nah, just TV. I was like, all right. And then my boy kept bugging me. To, and this is 2018. He's like, do a podcast, do a podcast. At the time, I looked down on podcasts. I was like, what is a podcast? That's like, that's where you get old. That's like, where you that's get old. Really, yeah. <laughs> right. It happens that fast. It <laughs> happens that fast. You thought you were the cool guy, and then you look up, and you know, yes, it happens that fast. It's a very competitive, stupid, stupid game, the one of broadcasting. I can't even imagine. you. Have you met anywhere? You've seen a lot of life. Have you met a less impressive swath of people anywhere in life than television executives. <laughs> <laughs> it's unreal. It's unreal. But, but you know, it's like, it, it's, it's like television executives, movie <laughs> producer. It's like, it's the same, like, how are they allowed to run everything? <laughs> yeah. Cause it's, it, it, it's really tough because in, in football, there's a coordinator who sees the field and has assistance and, they're doing all these projections and they're trying to figure out uh, all the strategies and they're like, all right, let's find their tendencies and we can come up with a calculated formula and attack. But then you get the TV exec. I, look, I have benefited from this ig ignorance as well. Like when they're like, yeah, we should try that. And I'm like, wow, that that easy? You think you got to go to Syracuse Media School and, <laughs> you know, get your PhD mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you got to have all these, the resume. And they're like, no, no, I just... It was a nice brunch, and I think what you said makes sense. Let's try it. And literally, we'll create a show just like that. And it's like, wow. And so I, I just went through that industry, and I was like, at the end, the same things that they were saying no to, they were saying yes to. And so literally, my next deal, they're like, podcast? You want to do radio again? I was like, that was just four years. Then. Yeah, well, you were ahead of the game without realizing you were ahead of the game is what happened, right? You, mm. didn't, you didn't understand what was being whispered to you mm -hmm. ab about uh, about the profession that yes you needed you needed a support system in place to grow the person you would become on american cable television in everyone's homes like yeah. you value that platform yeah. you that's that you being maximum you on that platform would educate every day in a way, in a way that's necessary now, not just so you're arguing with somebody across the table, but you're like unspooling real wisdom because people need to hear some shit now that's, you know, more meaningful than when, than the God we've been serving for a long time. Yes, that's exactly it. And I still was scared, even though the universe was whispering to me, maybe starting to yell, like, let's go. Um, you know, Whitlock leaving in midnight hour, Acho wanting it all. And I'm like, okay. And I'm like, this is all 
pointing in the one direction, but I still don't know. I got little kids here. I got people to feed. I got a life to live. And then Pat McAfee. I remember being in my driveway. I, I don't know what day it was. And he had some video where he was giving out a million dollars to everybody. He just signed that fan duel deal. And I was like, he has a, and I, at that time I never watched his podcast. And I was like, that's a podcast? And I, then, then all of a sudden you start to do your, your research. I'm going backwards. I'm like, 2017, he couldn't work at ESPN. The same ESPN I got two jobs at. And he can't get in the door because he's the punter. And now he's coming back with a vengeance <laughs> to lap everyone in the industry 18 times over. Oh, I got the wrong car. Like, I, uh, I can say I'm the bad driver, but I'm going to say I'm going to switch cars first and switch lanes and see how I roll. What an amazing thing for you to realize like that. You thought you were ahead of the game, ahead of the game, ahead of the game, and then you turn around and you're like, oh, my God, I didn't see that coming at all. I didn't see that, that at all. I could have built all that. I could have built what Shannon Sharp is building right now. Like, I could have built all of that if, if I had somebody mm -hmm. like i i think you could work within the system you mm -hmm. could oh, yeah. you you oh, could yeah. you could do the show you want to do mm -hmm. within the system if you just had similarly minded people around you and i don't know how many of those you encountered along the path there you go that's the thing it's like max and i used to always say this is so funny we were like we should just throw a camera in here and just go at it this is like 2014 2013 just throw a camera in here because it was like hilarity all the time. Like, you were doing a lot better show than just about anybody in radio because your dynamic was so, I mean, like that, there was nothing. If you had had, if you had put that on a simulcast every day, real friendship, real brothers growing up together, mm -hmm. learning things about each other and being more vulnerable at microphones than most men like you are willing to be. Yeah. And that's what we were doing. And we had <laughs> so many funny comparisons and contrasts. It was like w billboards. One's the rapper, and one's the national typewriting champion. But he was the rapper. That's right. You're, that's right. You, you're the one who won the the typewriting championship. I'm the nerd. You're the champion. Type. Like yes, you guys. You guys had the perfect chemistry for yeah. spending three hours together laughing. And furthermore, that platform would have been or it was something. How many people got to know you through that? Oh yeah. Know you for real. Yeah, like know yeah. you in ways that Los Angeles never knew you before that because there's something different about you're that big ass voice and everyone is impressed with his credentials. Everyone knows who and you're mm. extending to Max. We are we're peers. We are we are equals. I'm the athlete and you're you're the journalist, but we're brothers. Yep. And that's how it was, man. I mean Thankfully, it was in L.A. Even though we were doing great national numbers and we were a local show, we were, like, keeping up with the big dogs. Being home, like, everywhere I go to this day, there's not going to be a post or video ever of me without someone saying, Max and Marcel, come back. And, you know, Max and I have talked about that. It's kind of like, all right, in your back pocket, you know you got something there. When do you play it? Do you play it? So we've had those conversations but they have been 30,000 feet up in the air. We have not tried to nail down particulars. And that's part because that's my boy. And it's like, dog, ESPN is paying you for another year or so. Don't even think about anything else. But think about what's next in that year or so. But do not rush to do something else. Why would you ever? And so. Oh, but the for, two of you being able to do anything together with the wisdom you've accrued about like real life shit. I mean, yeah. Max, you talked about helping him with his brother's death there i mean you can try to help somebody with that but i'm mm. i've been avoiding people for two months because mm. because i don't want anyone rummaging around too much in that bin right now like someday yeah someday but at the moment like i i uh, it it moved me when you said that you've been there for him in times of and each other in times of crisis yeah so you're right now in your stage of grief, if you want to label it anything, is just the distance, the avoidance. Uh, right now, right I mean, now. I can't. Uh, it it hurts me to admit that because I'm a bit ashamed of it. But mm -hmm. it's just I can't. It. Uh, I know I need to hurt in order to heal it. I know I need to feel it in order to heal it. I'm not trying to talk about psychobabble. I just have never felt anything like this, and I don't know what it is, and I don't know how to. 
I, I don't know how to manage it or cope with it. It's just, uh, hmm. it's, it's a daily weight, uh, that, that you, you asked me about challenges before and I, and I maintain and will maintain that the greatest one is that I want to be present in all the loving moments with my wife. Um, mm. Uh, yeah, because yeah. because of where where we went through uh, uh, all of this, I'm sorry. I, this happens. It's been happening too much. Um, it's okay. Uh, it's okay, man. But the, the, the one of the challenges has been trying to do this every day. The grind of what this is every day. When I'm not quite emotionally in the space where you have to be to do it correctly, like <laughs> that. That's a that's a real difficulty for somebody who's trying to, to do this well, mm. you know, because, <sighs> because it's a lot of responsibility. Yeah. You know, I mean, can't feel or heal for you. I've always challenged this. Tell me, my mother died in 2005, and to this day I have not dealt with it. My sister dealt with it immediately and still deals with it to this day. She goes to the grave site. I rarely, rarely do. She has my mother's birthday. She confronts the pain. She looks at pictures. I rarely do. And I will say this because... The way I've been able to heal from it is, one, I let her death and her live through all things I do. But that's just high, high-level thought. In reality, I live through avoidance. I had gotten to a place where, whether it was football, whether it's NFL, college, I wouldn't see my mother for three months, four months. You know, you're away. I'm in New York City and she's in L.A. And do you know to this day the story I tell myself to heal is I'm just away at school. I'm just away at camp. And I'll see her soon. And that used to be two months, three months, four months. Now it's forever. But that's how I deal with it and it's it's loosely avoidance of that pain but i don't know if we're all designed to about face and confront those moments the same yeah i mean that's why they say everybody grieves differently but i would say it's one of the few places where i could take some uh some pride in in my in my strength because uh even though i've avoided this with with others, I haven't with my most intimate partner who makes me feel mm -hmm. most loved so that I can, so that I can carry on yeah. the lessons of what my brother taught me because he wanted me to live a shared joyous life. That's mm -hmm. what it's, it's the, it's the only way to honor him, but to, to learn the lessons of that, to love like that risks Ooh. that you can't avoid the pain. Like there's no, you're telling me you're like one of the toughest people I've ever heard of and you're telling me no that one mm. i figure out ways to rationalize around it because that one's too big for me i don't like the mortality in that one yep you heard me loud and clear and it's only because of this I, other than being a mama's boy and look i love i did everything for my mother i i felt cursed for a moment there you mean to tell me i do all of this and then my mother dies when i'm finally here like, she couldn't just enjoy all this work and it coming to fruition right now. And I felt that. But the moment that it really said, it told me, that is a weight in the weight room you will never try to lift. That is an amount that I'm never going to put on the bar, was my mother at her funeral. And I've never seen this before. It, it was the fact that it was time to close the casket. And the pastor comes to me and grabs my hand and says, can you do it? And that toughness kicked in and that 
put on the spot, I was like, yeah, I can do it. Never even thinking what I was about to do. And having to walk over there and then literally having to close the casket on my own mother, powerless. Think about it. Close it. That means gravity is going to help you. All you got to do is touch it. It'll, it'll slam, let alone close it. And I couldn't move. I couldn't do anything. And I think that was my, that was my activation to avoidance. Like, I can't. And I want to, because I know the therapist would say, you should, you need to. But the realest in me is like, some things you just can't do. And that's one of them for me. Where else would I find avoidance from you uh, that's that self-aware? Because... I don't imagine there are a whole lot of things like that where you're saying I can't do I that's I, that's a bridge too far for me. Mm-hmm. I'm this level of tough over there. That's an emotional landscape. I ain't even I'm not even going to touch it. I'm not even going to try. Yeah, you know what's funny, Dan? Because of that, because the only thing that scares me is death. That I'm not scared of anything while I'm alive. I'm not scared of anything living like. Like you put a gun on me. I'm like, oh, don't shoot me. You know, not that. I'm saying no challenge, no obstacle, no discussion. And that's what's empowered me to just take on all things and really try to right my wrongs and right some of the wrongs that are going to be inherited for this next generation if we don't decode and fix what's in narrative and messaging. So... Not scared to talk about anything, confront anything, because there's, a, there's that one thing. Superman can do it all except go to Krypton and deal with some kryptonite. And that's my kryptonite. I'm stunned to hear it from you, honestly, because, and maybe I shouldn't be, but I, I had not regarded, I mean, as painful that, as this is, I had not regarded it as something that someone of your self-awareness and acumen wouldn't force himself and challenge himself to do under the idea that there is growth on the other side of pain. I know it works for everything. Ah, And I, and I know that that's the same mechanism at play for all of my, your, everyone's success right behind that obstacle, that adversity is that gain is that success. And there's no way (laughs) at least in the 18 years so far, there's been no way, no thought of even confronting it. Crying, yes. Of course, missing, but confronting. And when I say that, I mean like deeply swallowing the reality that that was it. Nah, I take on all other challenges. I think of you as a bit immortal in some of the challenges that you have conquered. I know uh, it might sound like hyperbole to some, but the degree of difficulty on the things that you achieved, I think Mm -hmm. you're proud of yourself. Even as hard as you may be on yourself, you know that you conquered some things, correct? Mm -hmm. Uh, But it doesn't, I'm just not sure along the path from the way that you describe it, and I might recognize some of this, how much joy you've had along the path because so much of it must have felt like relief. So much of it, uh, and so much of it brought problems that you were not expecting uh, that were so much different than the original uh, problems that you thought you'd be inheriting. Like, I understand succumbing to temptations when you're young and a fool and arriving at what everyone else thinks is what should bring you happiness. But I don't know the man who's looking inside himself and saying, I still feel empty here. These things... What everyone else is telling me I should be, I expect something better from myself. Yeah. You know, it's, woo. Like, we're all given this value system, whether you understand it or agree with it or not. It's kind of placed on you, whether it's culturally, through your family relationships, expectations, community, whatever. It's just like these messages, and you just hear them, and it's this outer chorus. And that outer chorus gave me a checklist. And I checked it, and I was like, Excuse me, that was deep. And then, <laughs> and then I checked that list. And once I checked it, I was like, now where's my list? And my list didn't, it wasn't congruent with that. It, it, some of that, but not all of that. 
And the same guy that wanted to enjoy and did enjoy NFL riches is the same guy that also wanted to grade papers for fifth grade. Man, it sounds like you were a bit trapped in a football player's body. Like you had to choose and construct this particular prison to get out of your circumstances, right? Mm -hmm. Because football doesn't choose you. (laughs) No, no, no. Or you don't choose football. Football Football chooses you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, in simple, it was the way out. And And I felt so damned that... I was as good, if not better, in the classroom. I was an academic decathlete in fourth grade, like just nerded up. And I was like, okay, where is this going to take me? And they're looking at me like, not, I don't know where and not as far as that football wheel. So here you go. And I love football, but I was like, what else? And this is the time where you had to be a rapper or entertainer or a baller or good luck, even though we knew education was the key. And I was like, What? And I, I was like, once again, do not fight the model. Do not fight the beast, right? Get there, get in there, and then change it from the inside out. Oh, good luck with that. Oh, no. <laughs> I, put in, I put in a lot of years and realized, <laughs> get out. <laughs> what, are you, what kind of fool are you? Change it from the inside out. What I tried, the, What the hell are you talking Dan, about? I literally went from Jets Patriots. You're not a fool. What kind of idiot are you? Changed the television machine from the inside out because of the strength of your voice. I and- tried. I thought, look, we all know real <laughs> from fake. I was like, they going once they see it real, they're going to love it. And they were like, yeah, we want what lighter. A, what a fool you are. Oh, yeah. I admire you so much uh, as, no. as a master <laughs> intellect. No, no, no. That, that, once again, like McAfee hit me in the back of the head. Like, whoa, where you come from? Same thing with this. It, it was the realization. You thought you were going to change the industry mm-hmm. with the strength and power of your voice because why wouldn't you? You've already overcome all the other odds. Yeah, that's part of it. And the other part was we all get it, but we all don't want to get it. And it's weird. Like, it's just it's education versus entertainment. It's this edutainment blend that... I thought I was going to be able to strike the perfect balance to do it. I swear I was. And I was like, maybe I still will in a different way, but I have to go away. Because our industry now, look at the Kings. And then you look at what the Kings are doing, you're like, can't do that. And and get what I'm trying to do. So, you know, let them do that. Let me go around. Let me pull a McAfee, come back in five years, and say, aha, told you guys, this is it. Well, we'll what's the plan for that before we get you out of here? And I'd like to figure out a way to continue these conversations. So tell the people what it is uh, that you're doing, how it is that they find you, because I will tell them again, you've been an important voice, a neglected voice, I would Mm, say. Even with the opportunities that you've had, you've been an important voice for a long time, and I want people to hear the full wisdom that you have to share now that you seem to be your most balanced adult and happiest self. Oh, I appreciate it, Dan. Um, so I have a daily show Monday through Friday, never shut up. Um, and that's on Brinks TV, reach TV and YouTube TV. Um, and I do that daily show every day. Uh, really just the intersection of sports entertainment and we learn life lessons. Uh, so you check me out there at, Marcellus Wiley on all socials and it's going so well like the the biggest fear is like when you leave somewhere you're like was it the machine or was it me you know and to be able to grab audience and come with me and people that rock with me we've been doing it for eight months got 130,000 subscribers really excited because I know I'm not the hare I'm the tortoise you know but I always watch that cartoon too the tortoise will win so I'm like all right I'm going to win but I'm going to take it the right approach, the right way, um, and just make sure that I can help as many and inspire as many on the way. So you can check me out there. We're doing amazing. Uh, the comp- Like you said, it's hard, it's challenging, but uh Oh, but so you're rewarding. proud of it. But mm. you're proud of it. Like, it's your way. It's, it's yeah. your... It's the most complete you trying to do it as the best you in service of you and the things that you believe in. You got there. Yeah. You, you, you took... The path wasn't what it 
should have been. It could have been just all supported because you had all of the wisdoms that you needed to have. Yeah. You didn't understand uh, that the hard part was once you get in the machine, <laughs> not getting to the machine. Yes, yeah, say it again, man. I did, I did not. I mean, it was a smack in the face. And I was like, wow. And it's so funny because I have so many great relationships with people in the industry, executives included. And they literally text me all the time. This is one thing. I know you get this, too. A guy would be on air or at a place, and he'd be like, can't say this on air, but let me hit Wiley up. Keep going. Say that again. Oh, I agree. But then they have to go on air and do the persona, you know, the song and dance. So You sound like you're dis like legitimately disgusted by it. You sound, <laughs> you, no, you sound, I, I've been gentle. I've been arguing with Stephen A. about this, and I don't want to mm. head back into that hornet's nest for you <laughs> there's no need uh but uh i've been having the argument of this could be so much better and so much more impactful all of it as the platforming and there is a place to get your nutrients and your funny it doesn't it doesn't have to be the cartoonish thing yeah that I, it is now yeah I'm, I'm not a fan of that flavor um i think there are a lot of other attributes to a stephen a or to any of those kings up there that are doing amazing um, and when they lean into the ones that are just low frequency, you know, just everybody, like right now, I can post for my foundation, projecttransition.org, go there. I can post something for my foundation that is positive for the community, helping out kids, giving out scholarships. I know I can get 50 likes, <laughs> you know what I mean? Just to throw a random number out there. People are like, oh, boring, whatever. Then I know also, oh, I could go out right now on Sunset Take it off, act a fool, and get 500,000 likes, you know? And I'm like, okay, so we all know that. That's the formula, right? Why do you keep trying to get 500,000 likes? Like, why don't you talk about the things that are more important than just the like, the love, the deeper parts? But I get it. Everyone is not the same, so I allow them to do what they do. I'm going to do what I do, and uh, we'll see how this game goes. I respect it. I admire it. I have for a long time. Thank you for spending so much time with us. I oh, appreciate you, Dan. You're the man, brother.